Iran has hosted the political leader of Afghanistan's Taliban, offering Tehran's input in peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government, talks that have been stalled in Qatar. The Taliban does not recognize the current government headed by Ashraf Ghani due to Western influence, in particular by the U.S. In this edition of the debate, we will look at how this deadlock can be resolved, one in which the Taliban wants the ouster of all U.S. and foreign forces from the country. Insecurity and violence continue unabated in Afghanistan. The most recent attack happened on January 30th when a bomber drove his explosive-laden vehicle into a military base in the eastern province of Nangarhar. Official reports said eight security personnel were killed in the attack, but local sources put the toll at 15. The Taliban claimed responsibility for the bombing. A few weeks before that incident, unidentified gunmen opened fire on a vehicle carrying employees of the Supreme Court during the morning rush hour in northern Kabul. No group claimed responsibility for that attack, which killed two female judges. Violence has picked up once again in Afghanistan in recent months, especially in Kabul. But who is really to blame for the rising insecurity in the country? Both the Taliban and the United States accuse each other of not complying with the terms of an agreement they signed in February last year to bring peace to the war weary nation. The Taliban said the United States violates last year's agreement, with one of its spokesmen saying the U.S. is bombarding civilian gatherings and residential areas in Afghanistan. The group argues that the attacks not only breach the agreement, but also constitute a grave violation of human rights. Washington, however, blames the Taliban for not meeting its commitments under the deal. The Pentagon says it's very hard to see a way forward for a negotiated settlement if the group does not fulfill its obligations. Under last year's deal, Washington vowed to withdraw all coalition forces under its command from Afghanistan. In return, the Taliban agreed to give some security guarantees, among them not allowing extremists to operate in the country. Now, with the new U.S. administration coming into play, Washington is expected to pursue a different policy in Afghanistan. President Joe Biden's national security adviser, Jake Sullivan, says the U.S. will review the peace agreement with the Taliban. Many believe the United States is seeking to maintain its presence in Afghanistan for good. Well, it's a no-win situation for uh, Washington. Um, the Taliban must know that um, <clears throat> that the Americans will not recommit more troops. Uh, that's almost certainly the case, that they won't go back with more troops and that they won't be there forever. Despite the fact that its war and ensuing occupation have inflicted heavy damages to the Afghan people. It is very important for the uh, countries of the region to sort out their problems without an outside interference. Uh, this is what is pushing Iran to support the Afghan internal talk between the Taliban and the Afghani government, regardless what is the role of the U.S. Uh, government can be. But with all the mistrust between the Taliban and the United States, one should think of the role neighboring countries could play in that regard. All in all, it seems that regional countries can have an important role in bringing nearly 20 years of U.S. occupation to an end in Afghanistan and support talks between various groups for an inclusive government. Let me introduce our guest for this edition of the debate. Peace advocate and political activist Shamu Baraka joins us from New York. We also have journalist and political commentator Simosan Abbas joining us from London. I'd like to welcome you both. Um, Ajam Barakah, let me first start with you. Uh, we're looking at peace talks that have been going on for quite some time. At this point, it has been stalled. But the, it's kind of strange when you talk about peace talks, and yet you have, um, on the one hand, uh, how the U.S. is positioning itself and posturing itself, and yet, uh, on the other hand, uh, you have the Taliban um, doing the same, but still violence is occurring in the country. What is your impression of what's happening and why the talks have stalled? I think the talks were stalled uh, because it was predictable that they, in fact, would stall as soon as it became clear uh, that Donald Trump was defeated in the election and that the Biden administration was coming to power. There have been reports that suggested that there were uh, back channel communications between uh, elements inside the Biden um, campaign and uh, members of the Afghan government. Uh, to ensure the Afghan government uh, that if the Biden administration was to come to power, 
uh, that there will be a review of the so-called peace process uh, with the likelihood that some way will be found uh, to continue some kind of U.S. presence in that country. So it's, it was quite predictable that this was going to happen. Um, there have been maneuvers on both sides to, uh, to create certain realities on the ground, both militarily and, of course, politically. Um, and I think that will continue until it becomes clear where this administration really stands and what kind of uh, pressure can be put on the administration to uh, maintain some kind of commitment to uh, extricating the U.S. from a two-decade-long quagmire. And uh, when you look at that time frame that was just mentioned there, uh, Samus and Abbas, two decades. Uh, you take a look at the way that the U.S. is uh, conducting itself in this peace talks. And uh, remember distinctly, it was months ago when uh, the Taliban actually uh, injured some U.S. soldiers, and yet the U.S. continued having talks with the Taliban. I mean, is that pretty much the, the level that the U.S. has stooped itself to after 19, 20 years of being in that country, even if it's having its U.S. soldiers being injured, that's continuing, continuing the talks? There are many reasons why America won't necessarily leave Afghanistan completely. Um, the resources that exist uh, in uh, in Afghanistan are one. You know, General Petraeus, when he was uh, lurking in that region, uh, was uh, hailing one trillion dollars worth of uh, natural resources under Afghanistan. Different question: How you get those resources out? But certainly, uh, that temptation of the resources within Afghanistan is one factor which often goes. Uh, un, unsaid, but it's certainly still there. Uh, and also, of course, uh, they, they, the, the negotiations should have given us a hint as well back on September 15th uh, last year, because the representatives of the Taliban and the Afghan, Afghan government gathered in Doha, Qatar, as you'll recall. Um, they met face to face. Peace negotiations looked like they were underway. Uh, the foreign leaders attending in person and by video conference lauded the start of that peace uh, uh, conference and the talks as a historic moment. But it was interesting to note at that time the uh, Taliban's reaction, which was far more subdued. Uh, their senior negotiator was uh, Molabi Abdullah Hakim Hakani, and he sat hunched in his chair in a uh, grand ballroom, hardly looking at the video screen and even refused to put the translation headset on. So, you know, perhaps the Taliban had a point at that time. They were very wary of any American uh, promises. They were they're very well known to break most of the promises they make. And the history of intrastate wars is littered with failed peace attempts. Uh, since World War II, nearly three quarters of the insurgencies have ended because of a military victory by uh, a government or an insurgent side on the battlefield. And only a quarter have ended because of a political negotiation or other factors, Afghanistan itself is a graveyard of failed peace talks. We all know that. Uh, let's look at, uh, if we can, one of the biggest stumbling blocks that exists in these talks, uh, Jean Mubarak, and that is the fact that the Taliban does not recognize the government headed by Ashraf Ghani. And yet you have uh, this uh, being a government that is accepted by the international community. How can uh, this peace be resolved? Well, that's a very difficult uh, challenge. And I think the way the Trump administration dealt with that challenge was to, in essence, sideline uh, the Afghan government. I think beyond the um, uh, Western European and various uh, Western European U.S. vassal states, uh, most people recognize that the Afghan government uh, lacked real credibility. Uh, that it was a, a government that uh, was seen by the Taliban as basically a front for U.S. power. Uh, and I think most people in the world saw it in the same light. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult for uh, the Biden administration to uh, execute a, a peace agreement um, when they have to pretend that they want to bring in and have as a full partner uh, this Afghan government. Everybody knows that it's the, the day after uh, the U.S. Uh, reduces or eliminates its uh, material support and political support for that uh, government, it will collapse. So it's a very uh, daunting challenge uh, to, uh, to continue, continue the charade of a legitimate government in uh, Kabul 
uh, and uh, a serious attempt to try to uh, execute a real agreement, uh, which means you have to deal with the forces on the ground who have the power. And in this case, uh, that is the Taliban. Well, uh, Simon Abbas, you talked about how, uh, and this is not a surprise, and it's not new news, that the Taliban wants U.S. forces and Western uh, forces out of the country, period. Now, uh, according to uh, reports, uh, the deal that the Trump administration made, headed by Salman Khalilzad, with the Taliban was that the U.S. forces were supposed to leave the country by the month of April. Um, is, that, is that accurate? I mean, you know, the details are somewhat, if not uh, at least a bit murky, about what happened uh, as to the reasons why the deal fell apart and for the Taliban at this point to uh, be hosting right now, b hosted in Iran, in order to see if Iran can give its input in the, in the matter. Uh, I think uh, the Trump administration or the people negotiating this deal would have known that it was very, very, uh, you know, touch and go. There was no guarantee that Donald Trump was going to come back into power. All the polls were against him. I think everybody had a pretty good idea that there was, uh, there was going to be uh, a strong chance that uh, anything that he wrote wasn't really worth the paper it was written on in terms of a deal. So uh, I think that uh, it's why I think nobody was really taking it terribly seriously. But of course, uh, the idea of a deal succeeding and the likes of Iran and say, Russia and Pakistan, and all the neighboring nations actually uh, has to be uh, pursued. And uh, the Americans shouldn't be the main arbiters. They shouldn't arbitrators. They shouldn't be the main, uh, if you like, reason whether a a, uh, an agreement is reached or not. The regional uh, powers have a far you know, better chance of achieving a peace because it's in their interest to have peace in their own backyards. The Americans don't have that interest. Uh, they were there primarily under the guise of fighting uh, war uh, on terror were actually just there to occupy geopolitically a, a, a country which allows them put, to put pressure on Iran to the west, allows them to keep a hold on Pakistan to some extent, uh, on the east as well, and also to pose a, uh, if you like, a, a, a threat to Russia itself up in the north. And of course, you know that the, uh, the, the Americans are not very happy about the Chinese building up this Silk Road. So again, Afghanistan sits uh, right on the, on, on, the, uh, on the middle of that road between Pakistan and Iran and further north. So uh, all of these issues geopolitically for the Americans make it absolutely vital that they keep their uh, foot in the door, either by keeping a government uh, that's uh, their own puppet, or to get, for instance, India to have a greater role in Afghanistan, which they actually really were trying to do. India had around 30 consulates at one stage in Afghanistan, and they were really partnering uh, America as the possible uh, regional power that would uh, prop up Afghanistan, maintain American interests, and also keep Pakistan and Iran at bay. Mm -hmm within Afghanistan. So a lot of games were going on. Uh, of course, ending this is vital also for the simple reason that uh, the Americans, since they've been there, have overseen the killing of 157,000 people, uh, including 43,000 civilians, as a, as a conservative estimate. Uh, they've created massive suffering amongst the population, decimated its economy, um, and it would also really be uh, a, an opportunity for them to save face, to get out while they can, because they've lost Two and a half thousand or so troops as well and really they've got far bigger problems to deal with with COVID-19 at home and uh, the likes of China and Russia uh, pressing them from all angles in in terms of economic rise uh, they'd be far be a better place to actually you know give up the ghost in Afghanistan you can never control a country from a distance that they're doing and you can never maintain it uh, it won't happen so they need to find another kind of uh, another strategy here Focusing on the government again here, uh, if I, I may ask you, Ashim Mubaraka, that when uh, Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif hosted this delegation that came from, uh, from Afghanistan, um, he highlighted the need for the launch of what's called this Afghan-Afghan talks, formation of an all-inclusive government, something the Taliban also has uh, emphasized and highlighted. Iran saying, furthermore, that uh, it, it was ready to take part in efforts aimed at this uh, peace process that, that would be uh, with the participation of Kabul and all Afghan political forces. Uh, what, what are the stumbling blocks there? Is that a feasible solution or something that can be attained? Stumbling block is, is the role of, of the Iranians. This is something that they, uh, the, I mean, the U.S. is not going to, will, will, 
the U.S. is opposed to seeing more uh, Iranian influence in the area, in, in that area, uh, and therefore uh, that possibility is 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 somewhat slim. Now it can happen, uh, but as your other guests indicated, uh, there are some serious and uh, powerful forces uh, that want to see the U.S. to maintain a physical presence uh, in that part of the world even if it means that they won't be able to completely control the entire Afghan state. Uh, if they can cut a deal to maintain a physical presence, I think that they will. Uh, we, we keep in mind that the uh, Taliban has, has always indicated that they wanted to have some kind of normalized relations with the U.S. for quite some time, even before the attack. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a possibility of something that could be, some deal that could be cut that would give, uh, create a, a, a government of national unity, but also allow, under the pretext of, of security assistance and fighting so-called terrorism, uh, for some U.S. presence, both military presence officially and uh, their private military contractors. Okay, well, Samos and Abbas, uh, you know, we could talk about all the different factors involved here with the, the peace process that, that has started that is now stalled. But really, if, you want, if it comes down to it, the Taliban has made it very clear. And it's pretty simple if you look at it. They want, they can't, they're not going to negotiate with this current government because they feel like it's influenced by the U.S. and the Western countries. They have made it very clear they want foreign forces out of the country. I'm guessing along with that, they want, for example, U.S. bases not to exist there anymore. And along with that, they control 70% of the country. So what kind of leverage does the U.S. have in these talks? It's an increasingly weakening one. And uh, we know off the record that Pakistan's intelligence services and Pakistan itself has a strong interest in probably not really allowing the Americans to have a long-term foothold because the region is changing. Pakistan was pre previously uh, got a lot of money to control Afghanistan, or at least certainly to uh, influence it heavily uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, went along with American policies for a long time. And uh, it seems, though, now that increasingly the emergence of China, the Belt Road, the whole uh, CPEC, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, Guada port connection, which the Chinese have got with, with Pakistan, is influencing the Pakistanis more and more. And they're actually much more reluctant to go along with American plans for that region. And the, uh, the, the least of all uh, they would want is Afghanistan to become uh, a, uh, a hostile nation, which the current government actually is more or less. It's, uh, it's, it's not really friendly with them. They won't want that government staying there. They certainly uh, therefore hold the cards with the Taliban to continue that, uh, that hold. Uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran is not gonna trust the Americans with its US base propensity to threaten Iran. Uh, nor are the Russians. So nobody actually around that region wants the Americans uh, there because they know uh, they've got a malign uh, intent. There's no uh, really positive, you know, uh, infrastructure building in a real sense. They, all they've been doing is trying to build the security uh, apparatus and get the government to be able to stand up on its own feet. They failed at that miserably. Um, and what's worse now is actually also the suspicion is that um, uh, ISIS uh, fighters from Syria, Iraq and other places have been uh, ferried in or flown in or smuggled into Afghanistan, particularly And the allegation is that the Americans are also involved in this uh, on a covert basis to throw in another, if you like, wild card into Afghanistan. They can't control the Taliban. The uh, government is too weak. So they would need some sort of insurance policy uh, for another uh, wild card like the ISIS uh, uh, jihadists, if you like, to come in and cause may mayhem and murder. And they've been doing that. They've been disrupting a lot of the, 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 uh, the, the situation there in and around Kabul and other areas. So uh, there are many players, and it's a very complex situation. Uh, I think, obviously, for the people, the interest is to resolve the issues, come to a compromise. I rather feel it's going to be more complicated than that. Well, you have a new uh, incoming... Uh, administration that is now uh, in the White House there, Ajama, Ajama uh, Baraka, headed by the U.S. President Joe Biden, who has said that he's going to review the Afghanistan file and uh, is not sure whether uh, what was uh, reached, the deal that was reached by Trump, is uh, actually a good deal. Uh, we're seeing already posturing there. We also had, uh, if I may put these two together, the Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council, 
saying that uh, uh, the U.S. is looking to stay even longer in the country, not that the, Biden, not that the U.S. president uh, is uh, Joe Biden. Do you think the U.S. is looking to extend its stay in Afghanistan? You know, for all of the reasons that your guest just laid out, you, you would, one would think that um, objectively uh, to pursue that kind of policy would be irrational. But we have seen in the last few decades uh, a, a, a pursuit of U.S. foreign policy that, in fact, has defied rationality. Yes, I do believe that there are forces in the foreign policy uh, community, community that uh, would like to see a physical presence uh, maintained in, in Afghanistan. Will they be successful in maintaining that, um, that presence? Well, that remains to be seen. I don't think so, especially if there is a, a stronger peace movement in the United States of America. But I think in the short term, it's quite clear that the Biden administration has been making uh, moves that appear to suggest that they're going to find a way uh, to, uh, to not have to uh, withdraw U.S. troops past May 1st uh, and to try to galvanize public support uh, to uh, maintain support for the uh, presence of the U.S. using the excuse, I believe, of security, of, of terrorist uh, threats, uh, uh, stability, <laughs> supposedly, to maintain a U.S. presence in that part of the world. So, yes. Okay, we're going to end it there. Thank you very much for that. Peace advocate and political activist, Ajamu Baraka from New York. And thank you, journalist and political commentator, Saeed Mohsen Abbas from London. And that is for this edition of The Debate. For Mikha Vitaway and entire team in the capital, Tehran, it's goodbye until next time.